Since 1987, the Final Fantasy video game franchise has delighted fans all over the world. Square Enix's epic role-playing game series has sold over 100 million copies worldwide. Now, join us as we look back at all the magic, beauty, tragedy, mythology, and wonder of this beloved franchise. This is the Livestream Podcast, Final Fantasy Retrospective Series. The Livestream Podcast is proud to present the Livestream Podcast, Final Fantasy Retrospective. This is uh, the first episode in an epic journey covering the entire expanse of the Final Fantasy franchise. And joining me on this monumental quest are Jason Tandro. Hello, hello. And Ryu Shikaze. Hello. And uh, basically this podcast series is a love letter to the terrific Final Fantasy video game series. Throughout the series, we will be playing and providing in-depth reviews for nearly every Final Fantasy game released in the West. Uh, we'll also be playing games from the associated franchises, uh, such as the Chrono Games, the Kingdom Hearts Games, and the Bravely Default Games. Today... Saga! <laughs> Are you trying to hint at something, Ryu? <laughs> no, I'm not saying we should play Saga. You're gonna I'm get... just saying we're going to have to. You're... I was going to say, you're going to get your wish <laughs> soon enough. I don't think there was a Final Fantasy soccer game. <laughs> <laughs> No, but we're playing two, and that's goddamn saga enough. <laughs> Except you can never have goddamn saga enough. It's like DACA. Uh... Oh, boy. <laughs> Don't remind me. I'm looking forward to completing my thief run more than I'm looking forward to playing that one. <laughs> Speaking of that, have you picked back up your thief run? I had to bitch out, so let me explain <laughs> how this went. <laughs> No, I, I didn't 100%. I, I'm still doing it, but I had to make a few alterations. Here's what happened. I uh, In my normal run, I got up to uh, level 8 with my characters. Um, and after hours, literally hours of grinding and running and grinding and running, fighting ogres, win one battle with like half health, go back, heal, do it again. And that would take hours just to get to level 8. And then <laughs> I was like, you know what? Let's go into the freaking uh, Marsh Cave and try to get the crown and maybe move forward so I can fight tougher enemies and get more experience and make it worth my time. I get down there, I fight the freaking Pisco Demons, which is what they changed the name to the Mind Flayers and all that good nonsense. I'm fighting these guys. First off, I had one guy dead already. <laughs> that pissed me off. Then, the other guys are getting just slaughtered by these damn things. They're dealing like 80 or 90 damage per hit. And I'm, I'm just like, you know what? I'm done. I just... Through the, you know, turn it off, just done, and I was like, you know what, I can't do it, because I am not as hardcore as those of you in the fan base. <laughs> I am still doing Four Thieves Run, but I switched it over to Easy Mode, and it's, I want to I want to say this, it's still challenging, but it's like I'm not missing every freaking hit for no good goddamn reason, <laughs> so it's an acceptable challenge. <laughs> and you're doing this on the, the, the iOS version, the iOS uh, Android oh, version? Oh, no, I'm not doing, I, I, okay. No, playing on the iOS version is hard enough. Are you kidding me? No, I'm doing I'm doing um the PSP version, the uh, the um, oh, okay. origin yeah. version. No, I think I, they it, did something to the accuracy calculations in that one. It's it's weird. Oh, really? Well, I would explain yeah. a lot. Like, I, it's nothing that I can prove, but it's something that it seems like you you once after you hit the threshold it's a lot better for you but before that you whiff a lot more often i was gonna say i don't i didn't have that problem with the version of the game that i played uh, i played the 20th anniversary version for psp and didn't have that problem at all so i i thought maybe it was just the fact that thieves have shitty accuracy i didn't know <laughs> they do else. they do to start um but they're supposed to build it up like crazy not as fast as monks though i have an interesting story about my monk accuracy yeah. Did you know that accuracy is not a strictly derived value from uh, from agility? No, I did hmm. not. Yeah, apparently um, it is. it goes up when agility goes up based on uh, a formula, but it does not recalculate um, that to make sure that it has it's correct, like there's no sanity check. 
So sometimes if the game goes wrong, you can wind up with a level seven monk with 255 accuracy. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> like he's going to get it there pretty quickly anyways. But when you're hitting for 16 hits right out of the bat, <laughs> you're pretty happy. <laughs> Good Lord. What like, the... I don't even know what it was. It was it was right after I did the, the Pisca Demons fight, and there it went. <laughs> so, yeah, with, with that said here, uh, as you may have already guessed, our very first episode is about none other than the very first Final Fantasy, uh, developed by Square initially for the Nintendo Entertainment System, uh, was released in Japan on December 18th, 1987, and later released in the West on July 12th, 1990. Uh, the original concept and lead designer on the game was Hironobu Sakaguchi. Uh, character design by the beloved Sh Yoshitaka Amana. Uh, the programmer was uh, Nasir Jabeli. An interesting note on that. Apparently this was the first time that he had ever programmed a RPG type game. And he was actually the sole programmer on, like, the first three Final Fantasy games, if I recall correctly. And I'm not <clears throat> terribly surprised. There actually wasn't a whole hell of a lot of RPG-type market, both in Japan or for consoles, before this. Um, there certainly were RPG games, but they were all for, you know, PC or Mac. Um, the Wizardry series, uh, Ultima, etc., but... I think it was this and Dragon Quest that basically started off the console RPG. Yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, uh, Square was was not uh, uh, confident that Final Fantasy or RPG of any kind would do well. Uh, I think I, I read that uh, they only were estimating like 200,000 copies to be sold and it kind of pissed Sakaguchi off. So he ended up uh, taking a bunch of the versions of the games to and basically self-marketing the game, trying to push it and such, because he felt like Square was kind of giving it the shaft. Well, I mean, Square was in a bad place when this game came out. They were looking at bankruptcy and basically said, hey, make us a masterpiece. And then Sakaguchi came back and said, hey, here's an RPG, something that's never been done before on consoles, has been pretty much exclusively a PC thing, and is using a lot of D&D &D influences. They were basically trying to cut their losses, and Sakaguchi threw them the ultimate of wild cards. Um, worked out great, as we know, but yeah. yeah, I mean, I can see why they did that. Also, real quick, uh, of course, music done on this game by the wonderful The Master, Nobuo Uematsu. Um, an interesting note, Final Fantasy was actually the 16th game that Uematsu had scored. So that's interesting. Hmm. There were a lot of really games made uh, really quickly back in those days. Um, so I'm not surprised that he'd done 16 at that point, because uh, Nintendo alone had produced... I think it was over 400 games had come out by that point. There was a hell of a lot of games. Wow. I didn't realize it had been that many already. Wow. Uh, let me check and see just how many uh, games actually came out for... Well, real quick, while you're looking into that, um, I'll go into a little bit of uh, the development history on the game. Um, apparently, several games that Square had developed early on were not very successful, as Jason had alluded to. Um, and with this in mind, uh, then Square president and producer director Hironobu Sakaguchi stated that his next project would be a fantasy based RPG. Uh, the battle system was designed by Hiroyuki Ito. And uh, he had never previously played in an RPG, so Ito used sports, specifically American football, as an inspiration for the battle system. Uh, this can be seen in the way that the opposing parties are on opposite sides of the screen. Um, Akatoshi Kawazu, and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, Ryu? Um, sounds close. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, Kawazu assisted with the battle system, um, wanting it to match Dungeons & Dragons as much as possible, and to this end he incorporated the ideas that certain types of enemies have weaknesses to certain things, while being strong to other types of things, uh, such as, you know, your fire-based monsters being weak to ice magic and such. Um, it was also his idea to have the game's bestiary based on the first edition of Dungeons & Dragons, and the magic system actually was also heavily based in Dungeons and Dragons. 
heavenly nothing. It's literally Vancey and casting. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I mean, it's exactly the same sort of magic system that D and D still uses today. Yeah, in I, in fifth edition. I was gonna say even right. Uh, well, I was gonna say I don't I don't recall because I haven't actually played Dungeons and Dragons in a while. But it seems like the last time I played, they had done away with the so many uses of magic in a day. I think it was moving more towards a magic Fourth point edition. system. So, oh, um, okay, you're talking about the unearthed arcana magic pool variants, which they don't like. That always gets used for the psionic systems, and it makes sense there. But it never really picks up traction because everybody demands on fancy and casting all the. Uh, makes sense. <laughs> I'm I'm still pretty big into fucking uh, tabletop RPGs. I used to love playing Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, I ha I've lost the group that I used to play with all the time, and the and the guy that uh, was the dungeon master for that group was fucking amazing. But we're getting off track. <laughs> okay, so yeah. there are uh, seven hundred and I think eighteen licensed, uh, or seven hundred and thirteen licensed titles in the NES library in just the US and PAL that doesn't even include the Japanese for the Famicom. Wow. That's crazy. Jeez. And now some of them were released, you know, like in the 90s. But you have to think that, remember, we're literally halfway through the NES's shelf life at this point. So that's a... Yeah. So, so yeah, about halfway through 87. It would make sense for about... For, uh, 400 games or so haven't been released yeah. at that point, so yeah, makes perfect sense. Yeah, and about 20 of them are worth playing. So. <laughs> hey, 40. <laughs> I would throw. Uh, would Jaws be one of those games? <laughs> oh, absolutely, dude. Jaws? Are you kidding me, dude? Um, and, and the Punisher. Let's not. Actually, I like the Punisher. I can't say nothing about that. <laughs> that was my first shooter, man. Don't so yeah, for... California games. Uh, Kawazu also wanted to provide players with the ability to choose their own character classes and not stick the player with a pre-made party. Thus, the start of Final Fantasy allows the player to select the classes they want to play uh, for four party members and even name them. Um, so yeah, uh, with that said, I mean, that's pretty much pretty much the interesting points that I saw out of the development history on Final Fantasy 1. Um we all three decided to sit down and do a playthrough of Final Fantasy 1, probably the umpteenth playthrough that all of us have played through of the game. Um, <laughs> I lost me. track. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no, I was... Uh, I, the only time I'd ever beaten Final Fantasy 1 before it um, was on the NES version, and I had an emulator, and I had to cheat my way through it. This is the first time I've ever legitimately beaten the game. So you've never, you had never beaten the game before at all previously? Not legitimately, no. Wow. Oh, well, when you yeah. say legitimate, you mean you mean no, not, I, not I beat it. I beat it once on an emulator using a um, fast level and no encounters cheat. Mm. Gotcha. Granted, I don't blame you for the fast leveling because it took a while to grind. In the they they one of the nice things that they've done in the remakes is up the XP that things give. For sure. Oh yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, with mentioning that, then uh, what what all versions of the games did we did we play, uh, Jason? Well, when I played legitimately this time, when I beat it, I was playing on the PSP uh, version, which was the port of the Origins version, um, same, pretty much identical to the PlayStation port. Okay, uh, Ryu. Uh, the Dawn, the GBA version. Okay, yeah, and I played the 20th anniversary version for that was released for PSP. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that's pretty damn close to the Dawn of Souls version. Yeah, except for yours, it's a secret ending where it turns out that the Warriors of Light are actually all Batman. <laughs> hey, they're not all Batman at the same time. So in succession, <laughs> they will be Batman, but you see, one's Robin, one's Nightwing, and one's Red Robin. <laughs> Yum. Also, speaking of Batman... In the Final Fantasy V, there's a patch which creates a new class where one of the options is to turn Bart's into Batman. That's amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, oh, lordy. So, the Final Fantasy I opens up with uh, the ability to go ahead and create your characters, as I previously mentioned. You can choose between the warrior slash fighter, uh, monk slash black belt, a thief... A uh, white mage, a black mage, or a red mage. Um, what uh, what parties did we choose, gentlemen? 
I went ahead and did a tried to I tried to do a nice um what I consider a balanced party, which was I had a fighter, red mage, white mage, and black mage. Um, I know that the one they recommend is fighter, thief, white mage, black mage, but I felt like I wanted a little bit of extra magical firepower, and let me tell you. That came in handy, and the Red Mage is probably the most useful of all the characters in the game, because there were so many times where I either needed an extra hand healing, an extra hand using magic, or an extra sword, and I had all of them. So, (laughs) that's the party I recommend if you're playing. I went um, punchy, slashy, healy, hurdy. So I had uh, Kin the Black Belt, Garrett the Thief, Heals the White Mage, and Feedable the Black Mage. I went, uh, I went fighter, uh, monk, white mage, black mage, um, and usually, usually I do go thief, but I have found in my previous playthroughs in Final Fantasy that I just find the thief to be useless. Yes, uh, I, the thief is just completely I'm not useless. Pretend. The ninja, yeah. on the other hand, is stupidly useful. Oh, so yes. the th- and that's that's why I had one in my party. The thief is a Magikarp evolution. Yes, <laughs> yes, he is. <laughs> and uh, it's just a little side note since you named yours Ryu. the The names that I gave my characters <laughs> when I was playing through was all the members from the live stream podcast. Mm. I the I was the fighter. Uh, Vader was the red mage. Carly was the white mage. You were the black mage. Ryu. <laughs> all of mine were named. Well, not all of them because heels and. Feudable or Feudable is named after a, a hilarious joke from a game where all dwarves spoke German. Um, but the the first two were named after Kinshiro of Fist of the North Star and Garrett from the Thief series. I don't have interesting names for any of my characters. <laughs> I just made character names up on the fly. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, by the way, I find it interesting, Jason, that you uh, you named the Red Mage after me. You know, uh, Jack of all trades, master of none. So. That fits me perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be honest, dude. The only reason I made you the red mage is because I had no idea what class you would be. <laughs> you know, I, had, I I knew, I figured I figured the only universally recognized as a female character in that game is the white mage. Everyone always says she, even though there's yeah. no evidence either yeah, way. And they're totally and... forgetting that black mage is totally a trick. <laughs> well, I, you said yourself that you know you were you were sexy and British, so you know I went with that, dude. <laughs> Anyways, that we're getting wow. Okay. <laughs> we don't even need Carly here, and we're we'll, we're still perverted. I'm proud of Listen, us. I, okay. I bring the perversion. Carly just bounces it back. I was gonna say, well, in you know, you, you at a at a certain point we break Carly for the episodes. So. <laughs> <laughs> Not in a bad way. She just can't stop laughing. <laughs> <laughs> so after uh, we all got a chance to choose our parties and uh, uh, choose our character names, um, we actually get tossed right into the middle of the action. Um, Final Fantasy One puts us right out at, at the start of the game. Uh, puts us right outside. Damn it! And I'm losing the name of the name. Corneria. Damn town. Yes. Thank you. I like swords. Uh, Welcome to Corneria. Put- I like yeah, swords. puts us puts us right outside Corneria to get us started on our adventure. Or Cornelia in the more recent trails. Correct. Um, I am going to use the brief story synopsis that came from the Final Fantasy Wikia. So shout out to Final Fantasy Wikia here. Um, so Final Fantasy takes place in an unnamed fantasy world with three large continents. The world's elemental powers are determined by the state of four glowing crystals, each governing one of the four classical elements, earth, fire, water, and wind. By your and... powers combined. <laughs> About four centuries ago, a group of people known as the Lufinian used the wind's crystal power to craft a giant aerial station and airships and watch their country decline as the wind crystal went dark. Tiamat, the Fiend of Wind, waged a battle against them, taking over their flying fortress and the Mirage Tower. A Lufinian called Sid had an airship on the South Continent. And about two centuries ago, Kraken, the Fiend of Water, used violent storms to sink the Water Shrine and served as the center of an ocean-based civilization to use it as his personal hideout and to darken the Water Crystal. 
And shortly before the start of the game, is it Lich? Is that how you pronounce Lich. that? Lich. The Fiend of Earth darkens the Earth Crystal and plagues Melmond as the plains and vegetation de decay. And an, at an unspecified point, a sage Lucan tells of a prophecy that four warriors of light will save the world in a time of darkness. Uh, Merolith, the Fiend of Fire, awakens two centuries early as a response to the Warrior of Light's appearance and darkens the Crystal of Fire. After Marlith, the Fiend of Fire awakens two centuries early, which we'll get into why that doesn't make a whole hell of a lot of sense later. <laughs> uh, um, the four Warriors of Light appear, each carrying a darkened crystal, one of each element. They arrive at Cornelia, a powerful kingdom that likes swords, that has witnessed the kidnapping of its princess Sarah by a rogue knight named Garland, who will knock you all down. The Warriors of Light travel to the ruined Chaos Shrine in the corner of Cornelia, meet Garland, and return Princess Sarah home. The Grateful King of Cornelia rebuilds the drawbridge, enabling the Warriors of Light passage to the east of the country and starting the goddamn game. Yes, and I just gotta say that that opening that that whole opening image there, where they where they show the the warriors of light crossing the bridge and stuff, I love that. It's it, it just sends chills down my spine every time I I see that and hear the music playing over the top of it. It's it's beautiful. It's a beautiful moment. Now, while we're at that moment, I've got a fun little musical tidbit. Did you know that the Final Fantasy Prelude that starts every Final Fantasy game? Was literally composed in five minutes. Wouldn't no be a surprise. Uematsu was. I can't remember the exact story, but apparently Uematsu was in a situation where they said, "Hey, look, we got some more room. We need a, a song to open it up while we have the credits rolling." And he just sat down and just came up with this little tiny scale back and forth, up and down. If you yep. ever heard the piece, you know it's a very simple piece. Yep. And he just said, "Here, play that." It's essentially and... a six-note arpeggio. Exactly. Beautiful. Traveling east, the Warriors of Light learn a dark elf wizard named Astos has been terrorizing the area surrounding the southern continent's inland sea, Elfheim, stealing a crystal the witch Matoya needs for sight, putting the Prince of Elves into a coma, and stealing the crown of a minor western king. As they travel, they liberate the town of Provoka from a band of pirates and acquire the pirate's ship for their use. The warriors of light travel across the water, but remain trapped within the Aldean Sea in the center of a large continent. A large rock blocks the only exit from sea. There is a group of dwarves named Mount Duergar. Duergar, which is another D&D &D reference. Ah. Trying to remove the rock, but they find themselves unable to proceed without the nitro power, and thus begins... Basically, the first half of the game is this trading sequence. Yeah. It's not even a yeah. trading sequence, but it is. It's essentially a quest fetch quest. You're not. A, <laughs> you're not getting one thing to give to another person to get another thing. You're fulfilling one quest so that you can access another quest. It's it's a quest chain, but it is ludicrous, especially yeah. because uh, I short circuited it when I played. I completely skipped talking about to. Um, several important people and just went into the March cave. Yes. <laughs> and they all act as if you've talked to them before when you come back. Yeah. I it, never talked to Matoya except for when I dropped off the eye. Yeah. I was like, hey, here's your eye. Yeah, I, I actually went, I kind of, I guess you, I, I followed the, the game to a T and, and followed the story as it's supposed to be played. I've never tried to, to uh, break off of the beaten path before. So I didn't know if it would uh, throw things out of loop. So... The game is actually very good at letting you sequence break. It's it's nothing disastrous has happened in my knowledge. Um, it, it's because of the way the game handles flags. It doesn't actually set up a lot of multi conditional flags. And if you set up a like, if you get an item, not only does it set up a specific flag, but it also goes ahead and flags all the other necessary flags before that is checked so once you get the crown it goes oh well you probably talked to the king at this point we're gonna assume that we're on this dialogue tree <laughs> very very simple program programming i'll take simple and works over beautifully complex and is buggy as hell <laughs> you hear that bethesda i want a game that isn't buggy <laughs> continue jason 
Okay, <clears throat> the nitro powder is contained in a locked room in Castle Cornelia, the only key to which is being held by the sleeping elven prince. They retrieve the crown from the Minor King after defeating the Mesos, the Warrior of Light recovered Matoya's crystal, give it to the witch who makes an herb, jolts tonic, and later releases to awaken the Elven Prince. The Prince give the Warrior the Mystic Keys, which which they travel to Castle Corneria to retrieve the Nitro Powder. They take to the dwarves to help him finish the canal. Which I have to say, the fucking treasure that's that's locked up in all the myst- in all the Mystic Key rooms across the world fucking lame except for that fucking nitro powder <laughs> the one only other one, one that's, that's kind of worth going to are the ones in the marsh cave but like you really want to fucking go back there yes actually uh, you do y- yeah because one good experience and two at that point you can just start steamrolling yeah so i mean uh, did you guys do a lot of level grinding in the marsh cave then not particularly well not intentionally but uh, <laughs> Trying to go to every friggin' chest meant, yes, I did. <laughs> For me, it was always about the Peninsula of Power Man. Yeah, no, the Peninsula is a great place to train. See, I usually, I, I've, never, I've never done a lot of training on that. I usually, I deferred this playthrough, but usually I try to level up like 10 levels between every major boss. So, but I didn't grind that way this time around just because I get sick and tired of grinding and lose my patience with it, so. (laughs) Mm. Sailing to Melmond, the warriors of light seek out and destroy the fiend of fire, the uh, Er, fiend of earth. Fiend of earth, I can't speak today. Well, you you Uh, read the line right below it. I did, (laughs) you're right. Totally. Um, Fiend of earth, the lick. Who is responsible for the earth rotting? The warrior. And I bite? beat the pants off that motherfucker. For the record, <laughs> yeah. Can, can I just say it's always interesting that in every single Final Fantasy game that features elemental fiends, with the exception of nine, Earth is always the weakest. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Though I, at least he's a clever dick in four. <laughs> like he's still he's still completely a chump, but he's fine. <laughs> At, you know, to come make up for it. He's literally using the game <laughs> system against you. But I'm guessing that in 9, he just said, you know, they said, let's make him, like, actually decent, because he's one of the only fiends that you fight in the first batch of fiends. And then, but we'll get to that later. <laughs> um, the later. Warrior of Light enters the volcano Mount Golg, later became Mount Gulag. And uh, defeat the fiend of fire, Merilith, who is awakened two hundred years prematurely. Go on, tell me. Um, the reason why it, the waking two hundred years prematurely doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, it's because well, it's actually because of reasons that are still to come. But basically, it, it has to do with the fact that this is a stable time loop, and that uh, the person who sent them out should have known that this was going to happen, so should have basically said. Yeah, you should wake up early and not, you know, take your sweet fucking time. <laughs> so that's basically da, 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 da. the final boss of the dumbass. Yeah, time time tra- I don't think I've ever seen a anything involving time travel with the exception of Chrono Trigger and even that is some wonky things that addresses, like, even gigantic gaping plot holes in the time travel nonsense. Like, there's there's been a couple that do it well with... So, there's... It's not the predestination paradox, but it's the pre-awareness paradox. If you know that you do something in the past, and you try and change it, the universe doesn't like it. (laughs) (laughs) So, if you know the outcome of a battle, and you try and shift it, the universe says no. But if you know jack shit, fuck up the time stream for all it cares. It's completely subjective, mm. but it actually works a hell of a lot better. <laughs> oh, goodness. Well, we're, um, not, we're not talking about Final Fantasy 1 having the greatest story in the world no. either, so... <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. To, to, be, to be honest, I mean, the story was kind of there as a secondary factor. The main concern, and, and not to say that the story was not okay for its time but I mean, really it was basically the focus... a first edition D&D module well yes. there you go <laughs> but the the entire purpose of the game when he were when they were putting it out he said that he wanted it to be more about a customizable RPG experience 
and with of course the whole choose your own class you know D module you might say like uh, like like Rio pointed out there it has a lot of replay value that's probably n- I, I think not many other games can really say that except for games that embrace the job system um but target games are or, super replayable or what now target games like final fantasy 2 i think are also super replayable because they embrace i highly disagree sir <laughs> you don't think they're playable <laughs> but it's because the there is a randomness to the abilities that you'll get so you can just have a very different experience every time you play especially in the the romancing and the saga frontier games where you can c- just do so much different stuff and you can c- create entirely different parties but i'm gonna have a rant on that when we get to final fantasy tactics just saying <laughs> <laughs> about the whole random procedure nonsense thingy, but but let's move on with the story. Um, okay, warriors acquire an airship in a quest that's not at all convoluted. And visit <laughs> the Cardia Islands to meet with the Dragon King Bahamut, who gives them the task of surviving the Citadel of Trials and getting a rat's tail as proof of their deeds. When they return, he upgrades their job classes. Prestige First classes! Off, you can actually complete that a lot sooner yeah you can do it before the fiend of fire i i I, yeah pretty much as soon as i beat lick i was able to do everything i needed including getting the airship to get the class upgrade you basically actually did that yeah you you beating the lich and then immediately getting the um the airship and doing all that is one of the best ways to do it because you just don't have to care about you know Losing and levels whatnot. Exactly. And now I've heard something interesting. I've heard some, uh, people argue that the class upgrade for the monk is actually detrimental to the monk's growth. Do you know anything about that? Um, I don't. It might have something to do with the way that accuracy is calculated, but I don't think that is true. I mean, maybe in they, certain versions of the game, but what, the what is the argument? I heard, the one that I heard said that his mad that. He doesn't gain any new abilities. He doesn't gain like the ability to access magic like the ninja does and, and so forth, and the, the knight uh, does. He doesn't gain any new abilities. His strength doesn't increase any, um, and his magic defense actually grows slower than I, the monk. If that's the case, then it's, it's a glitch. Is he supposed to have a better magic defense, though not good? Um, no, and, and the, the monk definitely gets shafted in terms of how much his upgrade gives him, but he's kind of really fucking good to begin with, because... I was gonna say, I, he's on, he's an unbelievable, uh, fighter by far, yeah. the, I, I'm, he's, he does, the, I think he does hands down the most damage, yes. uh, physical fighting anyway. Because he gets uh, yeah, the most it's... hits, and he's got the highest strength growth, basically. The, everyone take, just... take the damn nunchucks off of him. Let him fight hand to hand. Yeah, once you get hell yes. Once you get to fourth level, take away all the weapons. Yeah. Oh yeah, and that's what uh, everyone is saying about the you know like the four of a kind parties. They say in terms of straight damage output, a level fifty party full of monks will do a hell of a lot more damage than a level fifty party full of knights. Yep. Hell yes, and then and then cast saber on his ass, and he's and he's even more of a fucking beast. Oh haste. <laughs> Getting, let him no have... no no saber both saber both. Trust yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. 32 sabered hits. Oh! <laughs> Beast mode. Oh, boy. I'll let somebody else wrap this up here. We're at, <laughs> we're at the Warriors yeah. and the Fiend of Water. All right. Yeah, go ahead. Re- the Warriors defeat the Fiend of Water, the Kraken, in an underwater palace near Onrock, and Tiamat, the Fiend of Wind, in the Flying Fortress. The four fiends defeated, and the crystals restored. The warriors find their quest is not yet over. The power of the four restored crystals is still being absorbed by an unknown entity through a time portal located in the Chaos Shrine. Once they travel 2,000 years into the past, the warriors of light meet the four archfiends newly created by Chaos and defeat them, causing a horrible fucking time paradox before Chaos can send the archfiends into the future to bring Garland back into the past. But shortly before he would die during the fight with the Warriors of Light and darken the crystals to steal their energy. Chaos turns out to be Garland, who was not killed but brought back into the past by the Four Fiends and empowered by the energy stolen from the Four Crystals to become Chaos. Garland originally created the time loop to live forever. The 
Warriors of Light, upon defeating Chaos, return to their own time, having broken the time loop, return peace to the world. While nobody knows what the hell just happened, they don't know either. And Garland isn't and dead Garland. because time travel. <laughs> and, and I like how the ending, even the ending is like, nobody's going to remember any of this. Mm -hmm. They don't they don't know that it happened, so it was kind of pointless. But you remember, and that's the most important thing of all. Yeah, yeah. I, I love I love the fact that the, the, the whole closing message of the game is basically, you lived the adventure. This was your yeah. story. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I guess we probably should have said spoilers before we started getting into the story here. <laughs> spoilers? Spoilers? What, you... like a 30-year-old game? Yeah, I was, that's what I was getting ready to say. There this, you go. This, this fucking game's almost 30 years old. If you've never played Final Fantasy, shame on you. <laughs> um, What did we think overall about the story, gentlemen? The story itself, like I say, was not a big selling point for me because, again, with the limitations of the hardware, it's practically not there. But oddly enough, I found that the individual quests themselves were interesting because, like, again – Going back to D&D, &D, it felt more like you were just trying to do the quests and you saving the world was just a result of you doing these individual quests. It felt very organic. It felt like, you know, because sure, every sure, other I'll Final Fantasy world, after but it. What's the loot in it? Are we going to get a level? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. And that's like that's like 90% of D&D &D right there. But, but I mean, it felt organic because like every other Final Fantasy after it, it's like all these heroes were destined and, and had prophecies and, and were destined or were engineered. You were, you're the heroes. Aren't you happy? And yes, there is the whole Warrior of Light prophecy, but it felt as a player, you weren't just saving the world to save the world. You were solving the individual quests that led to you saving the world. Um, and I, I kind of like the simplicity. I know it's silly, but I kind of like having just kind of little mini quests in between stuff. Um, if you ever get a chance, and I know I showed you, Mike, but if you ever get a chance to look at the Nintendo Power Strategy Guide, of all things for this game, now it's not official artwork or any of that, it's Nintendo doing their stuff in their very westernized take on it, it's not a mono's work, but... They break up the, the strategy guide into individual mini chapters for each quest, and it feels like each one of those, they give it a beautiful storybook cover, and they have a little blurb about it, and that's kind of how the game feels, like like perfectly divided chapters, and they just happen to lead to an end. Um, I'm not making a lot yeah. of sense, but I think I, I think I'm going to put it I follow what you're saying. I mean, basically, this game, the story itself, just feels like a bunch of little quests piled up into uh, you know one video game basically i mean it, so, if you if you didn't know better you would think that all of this stuff was just completely unrelated at some point at least that's the way i feel about it it just seems completely nothing seems to hinge on anything else so i think some yeah, of it actually they... is completely unrelated which is the funniest part like yeah um robots yeah <laughs> But, like, Astel? Astel ain't got shit to do with the fiends or anything. He's just a douche who wanted power. Are you talking about Astos, the... The, uh, the, 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 uh, the dark elf king, elf yeah. Elf king, yeah, yeah. He, like, okay. he, yeah. he has literally no connection whatsoever to any of the fiends or to Yeah, Garland. just seem random. He's, he's just yeah. a douche. That's, that's a sub-module. <laughs> that the DM decided to throw a plot-relevant, uh, you know, magic item into. Or even, even the fight with the pirates is just completely... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's the shortest quest of all Final Fantasy history. Free the town from the qu pirates by fighting yeah, the yeah. pirates. Yep. Yeah. And then, and then, oddly enough, after you pants them, the the fucking the the lead pirates all like, oh, I've changed me ways. Now I'm gonna go do good in the world. I'm like, really? <laughs> I'll say anything to keep you from giving me another trouncing. <laughs> You know, really, all you have is their word, so unless you, like, visit Provoco regularly, how do you know they're not just back to their old ways? I mean, you took their ship, but there are other ships. For sure. Are there and other ships? Know, I they're, mean... They're running, they're running a racket similar to, to Negan from the Walking Dead comics, if you're familiar with that. I'm not. <laughs> but, the, but the two guys who listen to the podcast who are... <laughs> boy, howdy. Yeah. Um... <laughs> We we say talk. We I make fun of your esoteric joke as I just referenced earlier D and D, um, but <laughs> anyways, um, 
I have to say, like, the towns, I always found the layouts to be kind of, I mean, especially in the NES version, when I played the one version I played when I was cheating and all that good stuff, I found the layouts to be pretty bland, and I found the dungeons to have very simplistic, you know, layouts that were just mostly, hey, we have a maze, um, but it was never really about the layouts, and they didn't have the technology to do really fancy stuff with any of the other, of the other, uh, dungeon layouts like they were just basically doing a bunch of labyrinths the one thing that i think really really in terms of design is really really solid is the combat system it's a very intuitive very fun every time you create a new party you're creating an entirely different game that depends on the version of the game you're playing i think because i think the ineffective attacks start to piss people off after a while okay let me rephrase that not including the NES version. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, if, if you're able to avoid ineffective attacks, even then... And, and we know the NES version was riddled with bugs. You know the spell Vox doesn't do a thing. Because <laughs> it, it recovers you from mute, but no enemy in the game can cast silence. And even in the remakes, <laughs> almost nothing does. Yeah. <laughs> but... I think that when they really piece it together now, and again, in the remakes and the updates, the towns look nice, but the, they're still using the older layouts. Uh, the two towns yeah. that actually have really nice layouts are Elfheim. I actually kind of like the new layout. I mean, it's like part woodsy, and that's really kind of cool. And I like Provoca, which is just, you know, on the water and has kind of a good old school feel to it. I know I say it, it's obviously an old school game, but I, I like the look of it. Um, and you said Crescent Lake. Yeah, it feels like a fishing town. Yeah, and you said Crescent Lake. Crescent Lake is is actually pretty good too. Yeah. Um, or was that what you were saying was like the fishing town? Yeah, no, no, no. I was saying I was saying Provoca felt like like uh, uh, like a fishing town. The the way that it's set up. Hey, well, yeah, it's 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 got that kind of like rafty look. If you ever played Illusion of Guy, it kind of reminded me of Water Mia. Um, that's a good game too, by the way. Um, <laughs> the dungeons, though, I gotta say, I I, I I am not really impressed by the dungeons. The most interesting yeah, one was the Flying Castle. Yeah, I mean, visually, that's definitely the most interesting one. But none of them are terribly difficult to navigate, except, except, the there's that one fucking uh, floor in the final dungeon that you have to traverse just right in order to find the exit for. Otherwise, it's like an endless loop. Oh, yeah. Oh, my fucking God. If you don't, if you don't have, if you don't know what you're doing, that can last forever. Um, oh yeah. If you literally though, if you take it in a procedural way, you'll get it in at most three um, different. Because if you go up left, up left, up right, or right down, right down, or right down, or you know, alternating, you know, which one, you can't right. miss it. It's <laughs> if you try and take it randomly that you'll fuck yourself over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. And the quickest, by the way, is up left, up left. Up left, up left, is yep. that what you said? Now, yeah. My favorite is probably the, um, uh, not visually, but in terms of actual design, is the other, uh, temple, because you've got the two directions that you can go. Yeah, that was pretty cool. The I wanted to comment on the sea shrine there because the the way that is laid out, the fact that there's like a town in it as well as having the dungeon. That's something that they play with in a few other games, most notably in Final Fantasy V when they have the Dwarf City in the um, Sea Shrine there. And I thought that was a kind of cool thing that they have that they brought back in later games. Wally ho Wally ho indeed. So that is a typo. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's an obvious typo, Are you but it, it's, an, it's a reference to Rally ho Yes. So, <laughs> 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 oh god <laughs> yeah i mean i have to agree on the whole i mean i the the towns on the whole uh just are visually uninteresting the layouts are in some cases i think the layouts are kind of a pain in the ass to navigate through um and the the same thing with the dungeons i mean the dungeons are pretty straightforward but they're nothing visually stunning. I, I didn't I didn't feel um aside from aside from uh, uh 
the the Sky Fortress, which was I think uh, amazing. It's probably one of my favorite levels in any game, just because if, vi- from a visual standpoint. I'm going to sound crazy here, but I and I went on a little, a little rant on my live journal about the game, uh, which by the way, for those of you who are not aware, me and Mike did live journal our progress through the game. Um, I'm sure you'll put links and all that good stuff in the description. I'm most surprised um, definitely stole a live journal. <laughs> hey, you know, it's not like we said we made a MySpace page dedicated to this. You know, come on now. <laughs> um, but no, I actually like the design of the floating castle better in the NES version. Um, and I know that sounds weird, but first off, the name change kind of bugged me because Sky Castle, I instantly get a vision, especially when you look at the old cover art. That had the four warriors looking at the just giant floating castle, and then they changed it to floating fortress, which is like so flying fortress. It's like so generic and uninviting and just uninteresting sounding. It literally makes me think of a B seventeen, the flying (laughs) fortress. Yeah. Well, there you go. Yes. Not not interesting at all. But also, no, I'm not going to say it's not interesting. It's just completely different. Because World War Two bombers are actually very interesting. Well, there's that heavy metal scene that takes place in a B-17 with the zombies. So, yeah, I mean, let me throw this out here, too. I mean, we're kind of we're kind of bashing a little bit the 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 layout of the towns and stuff and the the layouts of the dungeons. But I will say this. It's so much better than, uh, in my opinion, than Dragon Warrior. Holy Christ. Well, yeah, the. Some of the dungeons in Dragon Warrior, if you've ever played the NES version of Dragon Warrior, you could easily get lost in. That's by design. And not find your way fucking yeah. out. And and that's even with the light spell on, mind you. Yeah. Right. They are super samey, and it's by design. The... Yeah, I... They're, they are insanely difficult. So by comparison, I think I would much rather have Final Fantasy's layouts, just just as by comparison. So I'll, I'll tell you a more recent game, not terribly more recent, but a more recent game that w- should have had better design and had terrible dungeon design. Did any of you ever play the Dreamcast game Evolution? Never. It was... Of course, I never owned a Dreamcast. Oh, so. well, I mean, the game itself is actually kind of cool. But it's all procedurally generated dungeons that are all... So goddamn samey. You're basically just going through corridors, and <laughs> once in a while there'll be a trap tile. It's it's literally like you just found a bunch of the little pieces with rooms. Like you you took a hero quest board, you chopped it into like 15 pieces, and just threw them on a table. That's what the dungeons look like. <sighs> awesome. But um, but I want to say that the the design in the NES, the one thing they did right with the with with the Sky Castle in particular, they gave it a very creepy, imposing feel. When you were playing in the NES version, they, all they had for the background was a black screen and a couple of scattered blue dots, and that made me think of space. It's like, oh, holy crap, this is awesome. We've got robots, and now the heroes are in like what I figured to be like a floating like orbital space thing, which is a freaking unique, awesome concept. But when they right. brought it back, they changed it to just being above the clouds, and I'm like, okay, we haven't seen that a thousand times in RPGs. <laughs> so I actually think the NES version did that better than the remaster. Um, and that music, oh my god, that is like the best dungeon theme in – I'll just say it right now. Of any of the first three games, that is the best dungeon theme. I may have to agree with you there. I may totally have to agree <laughs> with you there. Heck yeah. Of course, I may change my mind as we go – through and play the other the Final Fantasy 2 and Final Fantasy 3. I highly doubt anything from Final Fantasy 2 is going to make my favorite list, but <laughs> Listen, it may. Don't 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 pre-hate yourself on that one. <laughs> my pre-hate has existed since the time I first laid my hands on Final Fantasy 2, unfortunately. So <laughs> Can I just say that, you know, Anybody who actually actively listens to our podcast, considering how much we, on the regular show we've been bashing 15, and now we're pointing out some of the flaws of one, they're like, what a bunch of negative Nellies, man. Now, now wait a minute. I don't – let me let me go ahead and say that for all of the pointing out of the negative points of Final Fantasy 1 that we are doing here, I love Final Fantasy 1. Oh, yeah. I think Final Fantasy 1 is a great game. I'm. I had. If if I were if I were someone that was looking into playing the Final Fantasy series for the first time, hands down, I would want to point somebody to Final Fantasy One, because it's easy. 
uh, depending on what version you play. It's <laughs> easy and it's straightforward. Oh, yeah. I, For exactly I, the it, same reasons, though, I'd point them at four instead. But then I'd probably okay. tell them to go to one afterwards. Depending upon what I thought of their skill level, I would direct them to one, five, or ten, respectively. If I thought they were a baby who knew nothing about this shiny little thing that was a controller, I'd hand them ten. I'd like, here, this is your game, buddy. If they were like, um, I'm pretty experienced, I know what I'm doing, five. If they're hardcore gamers, one. If they've ever played uh, Palladium, hand them two. <laughs> If they've ever sat for hours at a pachinko machine, give them Record Keeper and send them on their <laughs> way. So, I mean, let's let's point out some of the positives from Final Fantasy 1, though. I mean, the I, music. I'd say, yes, oh, I mean, that's exactly what I was getting ready to say. The music is beautiful. Uh, and I mean, for, for the time period uh, it's, uh, that the game was released, I mean, there's just nothing like it. Uematsu's score for Final Fantasy 1 is gorgeous. Mm. His... I mean, first off, again, like you mentioned, he'd done 16 games. This was his 16th game scoring it. So obviously he'd well honed his craft and knew how to work within the medium of electronic games. And he sat here five-minute arpeggio notwithstanding. Everything here was crafted in the exact same manner that Uematsu is known for. The lasting melodies, the character themes that don't really happen in this game so much, but you have town themes. You have, you know, yeah. the town theme. You have the dungeon theme. And then you've got the individual themes for the uh, the fiend dungeons, particularly, again, of note, the Sky Castle. Everything is dripping in atmosphere, and all these themes have carried on because they're so damn memorable. No, None more so than the Victory Fanfare, the Prelude, and the Final Fantasy Anthem, which are in every Final Fantasy game up until, like, 13 when things kind of went nuts. And by the way, fuck you, 13, for not including the Prelude. Yeah, how, how, you're not... How, that's the, the complete absence of the music... It was ap that's the worst thing that that drives it the farthest away. Linearity, be damned! It actually had a decent storyline. You got rid of the music. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, obviously, we can get into this when we talk about thirteen eventually, but uh, it just it pisses me off so bad that thirteen did not inc at least include the prelude, which is the one piece of music that almost universally everybody initially, immediately recognizes it as being a Final Fantasy game. In fact, so many people know the prelude so much, they a lot of them confuse it for the main theme of the series when it's technically right. the anthem. And I want to point out one thing. So I'm sure some of you have had the unfortunate of seeing Spirits Within. I sat through that movie, and I sat to the end credits, and I was expecting to hear at the end credits either the Final Fantasy anthem or the prelude. Nothing. Nothing. Just the movie yes. scores. It's like, yeah. you gave us a guy named Sid, one little chocobo lapel, and you didn't include the freaking music? The biggest problem with that movie is the fact that Final Fantasy is so prominently labeled on it, but it never delivers. It was just the spirits within a Final Fantasy story. Nobody, it, like, it would have come off as a lot better, and to pit my own shit, go watch our commentary track for that, because we made one. <laughs> oh my god, I'm doing that tonight. <laughs> Fi and Final Fantasy yeah. 1, for having the little five-second story that it did, better story than that movie. <laughs> By like a thousand times. <laughs> totally agree. We're, we're, yeah, we're, ta you know, we're talking the difference between Dragon Ball Z and Dragon Ball GT. That's the story difference. Yeah, and you know, like I said, I, I'm not, I, I am totally not now, I think that's completely a bit unfair shitting to, like to, to Spirits Within. It's not as bad as the difference between Z and GT. <laughs> Maybe it, I'd say it's about the difference between <laughs> Dragon Ball and Z overall. There you go. <laughs> Uh, oh, Lordy. You know, and, and I, I want to say that, I, you know, I am totally not completely shitting on Final Fantasy 1 as a video game. Final Fantasy 1 is one of, absolutely one of my favorite games ever. So but it, 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 It's uh, really a masterpiece. I mean, like I say, we're talking about some of the negative aspects. But yeah. first off, everything that I'm not saying is amazing. The music is fantastic. The, the battle system is out of this world and unbelievably fun to replay, especially when... You have a, a blog and have agreed to do a challenge run with four thieves, <laughs> and then you throw your goddamn PSP at a wall because it's too fucking hard. But yeah, still, and then you have to retrieve it from that wall. <laughs> uh, 
I, I had to call a contractor. Um, <laughs> but but you can create your own freaking party. I mean, that level of customization alone. Like, let's take a look at some of the other games that were coming out. You had either preset parties or you would start at like an inn and you would have to choose from the selection there. This game said, you know what? Be whatever you want to be. You want to play the game as four white mages? Go for it. Die. Enjoy it. <laughs> you want to play the game as four monks or four fighters? Congratulations. Steamroll over everything. Screw the difficulty curve. There were so many ways you could create any kind of game. And really, because the skills are so different, especially at that early phase in gaming, you really do create a different gaming experience with each party you put in there. If you sit there and have a mostly fighting party, you're going to get clobbered in the Sky Castle, but early on you're going to destroy it. If you're a party of wizards, early on you're going to have difficulty, but eventually you're going to be just destroying anything in your path. That's I think this is one of the games that kind of highlighted the whole linear warriors quadratic wizards meme. It basically states that warriors start great and kind of mediocre, but wizards are just... They start weak and they end up fantastic. Let's see also basically every edition of D&D. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Because holy oh, fuck, should... wizards. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing to beat out wizards is an optional variant of a psionic class that gets wizards. It gets wizard shit. I usually play as a ranger when I play Dungeons & Dragons. I've, I've played all <laughs> sorts of shit. I'm currently playing an offensive healer in the vitalist class who goes, Oh, I like your health. My friends need your health. I'm going to take your health and give it to my friends. Yeah, so so quick sidetrack on that. I actually had a friend that uh, the last time I played Dungeons and Dragons with the, with the group that I uh, that I liked so well, he actually was playing a wizard that fancied himself as a warrior. <laughs> he he actually ha had a a custom tower shield built that rolled on wheels so that he could wield it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. The last time I played before this current game. I ran what I called Unmonk. It was an attempt to see just how badly nerfed the monk actually was by running a character who did everything the monk did with zero levels in monk. <laughs> the only aspect in which I did not completely trounce everything that a standard monk could do was in move speed. And I was only <laughs> a little behind. <laughs> Oh, man. If you're wondering why we keep on bringing up D&D &D, again, we like we mentioned before, the game took so many assets from D&D. &D, it actually became a bit of yes. a problem for Square. Yes. For instance, the evil eye enemies in every other game except for the NES original version, the eye, evil eye enemies were straight up beholder enemies from D&D, &D, like the exact same model. I believe also, they were even the, called beholder. Yeah. The, so, oh, there you go. They were straight up called Beholder. I didn't even know that. And uh, the the enemies that were originally called Mind Flayers, also from D and D, little Cthulhu looking motherfuckers, they got changed <laughs> to Wizard and Pisco Demon because again D and D had a problem with that. Yep. Or I guess was it was was is, who owns D and D? At is the it moment, Wizards? it is Wizards of the Coast. At the time, it was actually um oh what was the name of Gary Gygax's company? Hadn't actually changed hands at this point. Was it um. Uh, I don't, I don't remember what Gary's original company name was, at all. Yeah, I know Wizards owns it now. I just didn't. Uh, I don't know who owned it then. But TSR. Suffice to say, TSR. Yes, TSR. there you go. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Suffice to say that resulted in the, in some some legal complications. Um, do you know the full story on that, Ryu? Uh, I've never heard the full full story because I don't think that. Uh, the details have ever been fully released. I think the, specifically because it never went to court, I think that they were basically hit with a lawsuit and decided to settle and say that, okay, we'll just change the names. Because, <laughs> be, and this is because, um, one, TSR had had its own issues regarding um, uh, legal issues with the Tolkien estate, which is why we have halflings instead of hobbits, and so on and so forth. But the specific uh, imagery of them could not be trademarked. Like, which is why we still have mind flayer enemies, and why, not strictly speaking, but beholders basically got turned into Marlboros. Yeah. Fuck Marlboros, by the way. <laughs> oh my god. You're, you're meant to have that opinion, yes. 
<laughs> um, oh lordy gra- i mean graphically uh how did we feel about the uh final fantasy games i i i'm really interested in hearing what you have to say about this micah since you played a version that was more close to the original nes version well the the nes version itself um for the time it was okay graphics the world map in particular was actually quite impressive for the time because yes. it's, instead of just having blocky you know town shaped blocks they actually had you know walls and gates and towers and you could actually see that on the world map that was actually damned impressive and after two they moved away from that design they went back towards the easier blockier layout which kind of confused me like even as as early as uh, i should say late in the game as final fantasy 6 they'd gone back to just simple map icons you know the most visually impressive thing on the world map was like vector um yeah but you had in this they they really went out and they, they tried to make a very nice natural looking world albeit with a obvious obvious gate of yeah. the all dnc <laughs> um but the, the the visuals were impressive and in the touched up version in origins they they really do they retain the classic feel but they definitely make it easier on the eyes. Like I said, Elfland to Elfheim from the NES version, um, night and day. I mean, it's just you're looking at a big one solid color green with a bunch of trees randomly scattered. Looks kind of hideous. In the remastered version in Origins, it looks freaking alive. It's like the most beautiful city in the game, I think. Um as far as the dungeons, the dungeon aesthetic didn't change much. Like I said, I mentioned earlier with the Sky Castle how it changed, and actually I think the NES version was better. Everything else was more or less the same, um, particularly the final dungeon. You really didn't notice much of a difference there. It was all kind of just floors and such. Um, graphically, like I said, both of them, both the remastered and the NES version were fine, but they are about middle of the road, whereas later games were like top of the line. Yeah, you know, and I, I guess um, keeping I, uh, this is a really subjective opinion, given the fact that this game is almost thirty years old. But for the time period, it was the graphics were top notch. I mean, I think graphically it looks far better than than, uh, for instance, Dragon Warrior did for its time. Well, I mean, it's definitely a, a, a partly subjective thing. I'm dying here. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I will say that in terms of what the graph, what graphics the NES was capable of, um, and what the Famicom was capable of, it's it like I said, the graphics at least in dungeons and such were were about middle of the road. The world map, absolutely gorgeous, no questions there. That is a ten out of yeah. ten. Um, but the town. Well, not to mention to go with that, you have the beautiful over map overall map music that goes with it. So well, that too, yeah. But I I think that part of the problem was they used a very restricted palette. A lot of the colors kind of are the same, and it tends to wash together. Wash wash together, yeah. Well, the problem is they literally had to... Because of the way that um, sprite allocation works, uh, they literally were limited to a very specific set of palettes, not just for a single character, but they could only have so many different sets of colors on screen at the same time. Well, that's true, but I'm saying that there was other options as far as... I mean, not, not not so much with the sprites. With the sprites, you're right. You couldn't really do much of that. With some of the town layouts, though... But again, that's I mean, still to and, do with sprites. And they should have tried more, but I think they were just sort of like, eh, fuck it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, it wasn't like that was really a major thing, because a lot of it is meant to be part of the imagination. That was the great thing about NES, actually, was that a lot of it, you had to use your mind and think, how is, would this really look? But, like, even a game, and I know this isn't necessarily a fair comparison, but even games like Castlevania had a much more vibrant palette and were much nicer to look at than some of the dungeons in Final Fantasy 1. Oh, I wouldn't. Uh, yeah, and I'm that's actually saying something, that. because yeah. I love the Castlevania series, but I have actually played the first few games in it, and they do look very monochromatic. Well, 2 looks the most monochromatic, one just looks brown. <laughs> That's how I feel about the Legend of Zelda games, too. Uh, the original, the first two Zelda games are, are, are not colorful powerhouses. I mean... The second one's better they're... than the first, but yeah, it's not... It's not as colorful as the series becomes. 
Yeah. Oh, com- comparing that to Link to the Past, for instance, my God. And again, th- that is partly of partly just the SNES is a better machine and 16-bit and all that. But I mean, seriously, again, it's just night and day. Um, I'll tell you another good example of of how that shifted. Compare Final Fantasy to Final Fantasy IV. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's just, Final Fantasy IV is a beautiful freaking game. Oh yeah. It's, it's yes, fucking it is. gorgeous. And one of the games I'm looking forward to the most in playing in our little retrospective series. <laughs> yeah. We got we got to go through two and three, but we're going to be rewarded with four <laughs> and six, man. Are you kidding me? And five in between. No, I was going to say uh, four, five, and six are like it, well, and I, I will even throw seven into that mix. Are like the holy grail of Final Fantasy, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. So. Oh yeah, uh, I'm I'm looking forward to those. And to be fair, two and three, I know we've been ragging about them a lot. They're still Final Fantasy games. They're still better than most. I other- haven't. No, no, wait. I have not ragged on Final Fantasy three at all. I've been ragging on Final Fantasy two, and for good reason. <laughs> <laughs> you two, just let, you three. just hate fun. I mean, that's the only reason. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. I actually have a lot to talk about with two, uh, other than my continual saga. Uh, speaking of how it uh, takes influence from the Ultima series. I'm looking forward to uh, your your dissertations on that when we get into the Final Fantasy yeah. 2 game. Oh, uh, me too. By the way, fun fun side fact for you. I actually found in my collection of game books an old thing my brother used to have. It was the spell book that came with Ultima 4. Oh, that's great. Is it is it the full one that actually has the uh, the copy protection in it? Uh, no, no, I don't it, know about it is the that. copy protection. What am I talking about? The, it's just basically the it has the reagents in the front and then the the, the A through Z spell book. Yeah, no, because because that's actually uh, how um, that specific book was the game's uh, copy protection back in the day. You had to answer a set of questions that you would find the answers to in that book at the very beginning of the game to get Lord British to let you go anywhere. It made you read in order to play the game. Yeah. My God, what a what a golden age of video games! <laughs> no, it, it did that up through seven part two, I think. Um, any of you ever play Arena? Yes, it does the same yeah. thing. It makes you answer a question about how much a spell costs. Um, but off track, I think. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Um, pull, pulling it pulling it back on track here. Uh, Rhea, what what did you think about the uh, enhanced graphics on uh, the uh, Donna Souls version? Um, the thing is, they're not technically the most enhanced. They're technically a downgrade from the Origins and the, the 20th anniversary version on the PSP, but they're still pretty very good. Yeah. The most interesting change to me about the Dawn of Souls versions is that it did away with the Vancian casting for the series standard MP. Yeah, uh, and that's that's exactly why I chose to play... I, I, it was it was between the Dawn of Souls version and the PSP version because I cannot stand that Vancian magic system at all. I I want yeah. my MP. I want to I want to be able to just blast a motherfucker with magic and not have to worry about only having five castings of a. Of well, a that's why spell. if you ever get back oh. into D and D or Pathfinder, go psionic. You, Mike. I was reading your journal. I read your journal every freaking day it came out. There was a new one. It was a. I read it. You mentioned buying ethers, and I wanted to slug you. <laughs> You're right. Uh, yeah, you, you, you can't even get those as drops until halfway through the game in the original, I don't think. Uh-oh. Yeah. yeah, I was I, uh, I went, I was going out and buying uh, uh, 99 ethers yeah. at a time. Uh, so I was keeping my, my ether uh, uh, replenished. Yeah, no. Every time I used one, I'd buy another. Yeah, I... I, I basically did uh the same thing and i ran through the final dungeon with like 99 ethers and had like 30 or less by the time i got through oh lordy <laughs> now, d- don't get me wrong i've done it i've done it the real way before and you know every ether is you know precious as gold or more so so I've, I've I've taken yeah. my lumps, but it's just sort of, and that's basically why I went. Ah, <laughs> give me all the ethers, all the magic. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not even like the, the, the magic is all that effective in combat compared to my monk, who is like, oh, it's dead. No, it's dead. While we're <laughs> while we're talking about that fun fact about just more fun little tidbits, fun fact about uh, this game is that, to my knowledge. 
you know, all the other games with Final Fantasy, they have the three elements, ice, lightning, and fire, and they kind of have them on an even kilter. It's just you've got, they are all about the same level of these two different elements. In this game, for some reason, ice is the most powerful. Yes. Like of the first... It certainly seems that way. Yeah. Well, of the first two levels, and then they start pacing them out, but it's just like they always have them as higher tiers. I just don't know why they do that. Um, I think mostly because I don't think they could fit uh, all of them on the same tier because they, for some reason, limited you to well, not not for some reason because of you know memory allocation issues and literal physical menu space, they couldn't uh, set more than three per spell level. Yeah, mm. yeah, and you know, it, it kind of interesting note about the the magic too, the the ultimate black spell flare and the ultimate white spell holy are really shitty spells at the point in which you get them <laughs> because they don't do any damage to any of the bosses and uh, uh, hardly at all. They they're weak sauce compared to what you can do with a with a knight or with a monk. Yeah. It's it's almost not even worth casting any spells with them. You know, I did something stupid. I got the Masamune or Masamune or whatever you want to... How is, how is that pronounced for you? Masamune. Masamune, okay. I've heard so many different ways. Masamune. So, Masamune is the actual correct pronunciation of a Japanese that's name. The, that's how you do it. Like I, said, I was trying to remember exactly what the correct one was. Um, but anyway, so I got the Masamune. And the Nintendo Power Strategy Guide, which I was actually using to get through some of these areas... Uh, which I got a digital copy of, <sighs> suggests that you give the Masamune <laughs> to your white mage because it boosts their attack power up, and then it's like having another fighter in your party. So I gave Carly the Masamune, have her attack, <laughs> she does 80 damage, and I get pissed. Because <laughs> yeah. I'm sitting there, because you understand, at, at this point, I'm doing like 300 damage a strike, Vader is doing like 180 damage a strike, and any of the black magic spells are at least doing something. That's not at all what I expected. And if I'd given myself the Masamune, it would have been the fight would have been over a lot quicker. Yes. So you know what's hilarious? Um forget if this is true in the original version, but at least in the Dawn of Souls version, after a while, um the 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 black wizard because uh, I don't think you can actually equip the weapon to the Black Mage, but he can become a formidable um, uh, a physical attacker in his own right if you give him the Cat Claw. Yes. And it's hilarious. But no, the, <laughs> the reason why Carly was doing jack shit for damage for you was because accuracy matters. Because accuracy, more than choosing how much you, you get to hit, is choosing how many hits you get. Like, how many times you throw out your punches, and that determines damage so much. That's why my, my monk getting that stupid 255 and whatever the hell glitch that was, that made my game. <laughs> like, I could just roll, you know, steamroll the hell out of people. Because I was getting was, 16 hints off the bat. That's essentially how I felt. I mean, I, I was just wiping out the bosses with no trouble whatsoever. With the sole fucking exception... Of some of the mega bosses in the bonus dungeons that are included on the 20th anniversary version. Holy fuck. <laughs> Ryu, did you play any of those bonus dungeons by any chance? I did not this time through. I have played them on a previous. And yeah, they're so, super fucking bullshit from what I <laughs> The uh, Omega and Shinryu are the biggest cheap bastard bosses in the whole of the f first Final Fantasy game. The regular bosses, I, I, to me, are a cakewalk. I have no problems beating the, the regular bosses. Uh, but the, the Omega and Shinryu can eat a big old fat... Never mind. <laughs> 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 they, they fucking suck. I did finally beat them, but it took several tries. Fucking assholes. Yeah. yeah. And... Ugh. Well, the only boss I ever had any trouble with in the game was, oddly enough, Tiamat, the first time I fought him. Tiamat's easy. Use break. You see, I it, tried that, but for some reason on my version, it wasn't working. It kept, it kept on saying he was immune to it. it. It depends on which version of Tiamat you're fighting. If it's if it's the first time you fight him, break works. The second time around, it that doesn't work. You have to 
you have to grind that battle out. Oh, I, I, I was trying it on the first battle in, in the Skyfort castle, and I kept I cast it like four times, and it said miss. Yeah, I got I got him on the first try. It, in my case, it didn't even come to that. Um, because I one round of Tiamat with your monk. With the monk, it, it <laughs> yeah. ludicrous damage. Did you? <laughs> did you go to plan? Did you? Uh, <laughs> yes, that's what I was getting ready to say. <laughs> did you uh, did you uh, power him up with saber and haste before yes, you? It... Yeah. Oh well, um, there was one round that was him throwing off some damage. Then there was the second round of saber and haste, and in that round, I literally did more damage than Tiamat has HP. <laughs> and I would have been able to do that to chaos if. Um, for some reason, I don't know why exactly, but I was still being affected by instant death effects, even though I had stuff that should have protected me from it, but oh well. I, I didn't get to one round Chaos. I had to three round him. Yeah, my fight with Chaos <laughs> was pretty fast too, but yeah. no, I mean, Omega and Shinryu are a motherfucker. And I didn't even try going after uh, the Labyrinth of Time boss. I can't remember what his name is now, but... Uh, I've tried fighting him before the first time I played the 20th anniversary version and got my ass really kicked and I got pissed and I've never tried to go back and play, fight him again, so fuck him. <laughs> <laughs> Any other final thoughts on uh, the first Final Fantasy? I uh, I think we've pretty much said everything about that. Um, just one last little bit of tidbit from the good old Nintendo Power. Um, of course, they had that contest for uh, Finding Warmech, which, as I'm sure we most know now, is actually the final hallway leading up to Tiamat. Um, I wonder how many people were playing that and accidentally ran into him, if that was even possible. Uh, technically, it is entirely possible, but you have to be in that hallway hitting enough battles because it is a deterministic seed, so after 64 battles, you will have definitely hit Warmack. Huh. So if you're yeah, only you last minute grinding, version. don't do it in that hallway. Yes, exactly. I never, I never ran into him, so... Oh, me neither. Um, but... In in the, the, uh, the, the version that you and I played, uh, it is actually random seed, not a deterministic seed, or quasi-random seed. Interesting. Um, well, so those of you who are listening if you're interested in the actual end result the fun little thing about the war mech of course you know you had to take a picture of him now do either of you know what that ended up leading to what war mech led what to? the uh, results of the contest specifically led to um no you idea the prize or something else the, the prize the the prize for winning was having your name appear in a future nintendo title that future Nintendo title. Hanlahan, yeah. Chris, Chris, that was, Chris Hulahan. Yeah, Chris Hulahan. And the room from a Link to the Past, which is a secret room that you can access through various art methods. I can't remember exactly how it was done. Um, consult Pop Fiction for the answer on that one. But yeah, Chris Hulahan room, it's totally legitimate. And that was for winning the War Mech contest. And that was a game that came out, what, like five years later? Yeah. Interesting. I never knew that. Well, let's see. Link to the Past. Um, no, it was not five years later. It was, I think, because it, it was um, five years after the game had originally come out, but not after it came out in the States. Because mm. Link to the Past came out. So it would have been two years after yeah. Final Fantasy. It would have been 1992. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it came out in 91 in Japan, so they actually went really far to add that. Though it was added only in, I think, the uh, U.S. version. But yeah, it came out in uh, 92 in the U.S., April 13th. Interesting. Yeah. Just a, just a fun little tidbit there, so... So, uh, uh, Jason, I know you ran a quick poll uh, regarding who your favorite or uh, chosen class was for Final Fantasy 1. 
Uh, what were the results of the poll? Well, I'm tallying up the final thing here because we didn't get a whole lot of answers on the live stream itself. So I actually I just shot a message out to some last folks to put their vote in. I got two more votes from that. Um, the one that has predominantly won the day out of, again, only eight votes, Red Wizard won half of them. Four votes for Red Wizard. There were three votes for Fighter. And there was one vote for Black Belt, which I think was your vote. It sure so was. <laughs> so um, I voted for Red Wizard myself just because, again, that was such a lifesaver playing that game. Um, what about – did you answer the poll, Ryu? Uh, I forget if I did, but I probably would have said Master. <laughs> so so you're, so you're on you're – on, uh, you're on Vader's side with with Black Belt Master. The Black then. Belt. Yeah. I, I'm on Team Punch Fist. <laughs> team pu <laughs> Team Punch Fisty. Okay. Um. So 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 yeah. I mean that's the thing. Not a whole lot of love for the Black and White Mage, which is kind of odd. I'm sure if the thing went longer, we would have more folks going that way. Um. I don't think anybody's actually going to vote Why? for Thief though. The black the Black and White the Black Mage in particular is useless. Uh, in the later stages of the game. <laughs> but, dude, it, there's that glorious middle section where I was leaning so heavily on Ryu and the black magic that Vader knew. Like, I think that they really peak out around Mount Gulg, but then after the class change, they kind of get less useful. Except for to buff the fighters. Yeah. I, yeah, I mean, yeah. I guess I agree with you. I mean, you, ha you almost have to take a black mage slash red mage and certainly a white mage with you if you want a well-rounded party. You just have to. you Because you, you need the magic at certain points in the game and stuff, but they're really useless by the end of the game. I, I think for my next fun playthrough that isn't a challenge that makes me want to pull my hair out, I think I might do an all-red mage run and see how that handles. Should be interesting at the very least. I know, right? Yeah, you'll, you'll find that they trail off a bit at the end, just but they still... Because they the thing is, the the red wizard doesn't get access to a lot of the really good in-game stuff, like uh, the knight and the, the ninja do. So, and they also don't get access to a lot of the really good in-game magics. Well, that's... So, you're... That's my only concern with the red mage, is that they're kind of a... The red mage is a whole filler. It's not yeah. necessarily a main leading man, but I'll tell you... When everything was falling apart, again, that's why I like it so much. When everything is falling apart, you want a red mage in your party. Yeah. Okay. I did fine with I did fine with my black belt, my monk. Yeah, you're you're. When everything was falling apart, lean on the monk. <laughs> when everything's falling apart, punch it. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Fuck it. Bring it down. Oh. So, with that said, here. Um, how many stars out of five would you rate Final Fantasy One, Jason? Uh, for me, it kind of depends upon the version. I would say overall, the only thing it's we are going to, by the way, keep track of this. Oh, we're going to keep on a rolling basis. Good, good. Yeah. Well, I would say personally, it has a few flaws, but it's still just such a timeless gem and such a well put together game that all that can be overlooked. I would say it easily rates four out of five. Okay. How about you, Ryu? Uh, three and a half to four. We'll go with four. Make it even. So, Jason's four. Ryu is four. It looks and like we both just said something foul on the document here. <laughs> and uh, I am going to go with four stars as well. Um, Final Fantasy One is, is for for all the negative stuff that we did bring up here. You do have to keep that in a certain perspective, given how old the game actually is. So a lot of the negative stuff that I do bring up really is just being nitpicky. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I really do very much enjoy Final Fantasy when it gets four stars for me as well. Yeah, and it's honestly like I say, the most of that is just again pro problems with the hardware. The game itself, can you imagine? And they really have, because I mean, good, there, there's about like thirty damn ports of this game. The game, yeah, I think it. I read it has more ports than any other Final Fantasy game in the series. That's not surprising. Um, it might. Let's see. There's PlayStation Wonderswan Color, PSP, um iOS, Android, mobile phones. But there's also the family computer version, the MSX2 version. Yeah. Even even with all the friggin' remakes that 4 has had, this one beats it. Yeah. 
And, and that says something to its last ability, because, I mean, they're not just making for all these sure. ports for the sake of history. They're doing this because the game still holds up today. And that's the thing. I was playing it, again, a, a, just a, an updated version of a t almost 30-year-old game, and I was having a blast. The, the combat system, the way everything pieces together, the way the the events unfold, it still is incredibly strong. It's a very, very solid game. Absolutely. And highly, I highly recommend it to anyone that's never played the first Final Fantasy. The you you have to take in that experience to especially if you are someone that wants to understand the roots of where Final Fantasy came from, and maybe if you know if you're somebody that uh, doesn't understand why we've been uh, uh, so down on Final Fantasy 15. <laughs> I think if you go back to the roots of the series and play some of these early Final Fantasy games, you really get an understanding for what made the series so fucking great and why it's so beloved by long, long time fans of the series. Mm. And I think Final Fantasy One's a beautiful place to start there. Just play one of the updated editions. Don't play the NES version. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I uh, play 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 the the Dawn of Souls version or the Final Fantasy Origins version. The those or I'm sorry, uh, not the Origins version. Uh, the Dawn of Souls or the 20th anniversary version, both of which are ter are terrific. The graphics are updated. They've got the uh, the uh, extra dungeons and such. It, it's uh, it, well worth your time. The Origins version is good if you can get it too. I had fun. I had plenty of fun with that. Um and. The only thing I will say is, again, the NES version is difficult. I would recommend not playing it unless you're really in for a challenge. Stay stay away from the the mobile version that came out with the Portal app. That's not oh, it's, it's, oh, it, it's terrible. Not good. Yeah, I, I'd go for the Dawn of Souls or the 20th Anniversary because uh, those are basically some of the, the, the most polished, especially the 20th Anniversary for graphics. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, we do want to encourage you also to send any questions you have about Final Fantasy 1 to us. Uh, you can send those questions to us at lifestreampod at gmail.com. And uh, let us know if you have any questions. We'll be happy to uh, uh, answer your questions on the uh, next episode of the Retrospective Podcast. And... Um, yeah, I mean, we can also carry on a discussion about it on the live stream forums, so uh, we do want to hear from you. And uh, please, also, we really want some iTunes reviews here. Um, thinking about running a contest for some iTunes reviews, so uh, uh, the more iTunes reviews we can get, um, the more noticed that iTunes uh, innate makes our podcast, and so uh, we could really use the iTunes review, folks. Um, so yeah, like I said, uh, uh, we definitely do want to hear from you. Email us, uh, hit us up with messages on uh, on the live stream forums, uh, hit us up with messages on YouTube, uh, leave us reviews. We want to talk to you. We got. Uh, do we have uh, questions for the listeners? Uh, not for the retrospective series. Um, I do. You think we should have one? I, I think it'd be interesting. I think it's, that's the kind of thing that really tends to. I know that on the main thing, it doesn't tend to get answered, but I'd like to think that on the retrospective, it might. Well, I don't really know what to ask about this. Then, um, do you well, have a Final Fantasy one specific question that you'd like to ask? Well, I think that uh, there's a there's. Two, I mean, I could always ask. You know, what's your favorite musical track? But I think everyone's going to say the Prelude. Um, yeah. I say we just keep it going with the, the poll question. I say, you know, tell us what your favorite class was, what your favorite party style was to play as. Yeah, what was your um, favorite thing ripped off of D&D? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, tell us, uh, uh, I guess, for, for a question, for your playthroughs, what's your favorite party setup? That's a good one. And, t and tell us why. I like four fighters because I steamroll everything. <laughs> It, uh, that's exactly why I like four punch master. <laughs> uh, I think, uh, I think with that McFist. <laughs> I think this is a, probably a good place to put a bookmark in this. Um, our obvious next game in the retrospective series is going to be final fantasy two. Uh, I am going to set a 30 day turnaround on final fantasy two as well. Although I suspect it's probably going to take us less time to complete it than that. 
So I will say that we will shoot for a completion date for November the 2nd on Final Fantasy 2. If you want to play along, please feel free. Sign up, uh, sign up for a membership on the live sh on the live stream forums if you're not a member already, and keep us updated on how your playthrough is going along. And ask questions because uh, I'm sure Ryu would be happy to respond to them. Yeah, <laughs> Ryu would also like opportunities to gloat. So <laughs> <laughs> you're not wrong. <laughs> so uh, I think with that said, then um, seriously though, if, if you need help, just ask. I love telling people how to break these games. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, Ryu, you may have questions coming from me. Because <laughs> fuck this game, okay? <laughs> yeah, have you set have you set aside, Mike, the way you you hate this game, so have you set aside time for the counseling you might need after playing it? <laughs> uh, my counseling will consist of pounding my head on the desk. <laughs> you'll, you'll, answer, you'll, you'll start the next podcast. You know, you're, we're going to be getting together for episode number ten here, or episode number nine about music. And you'll open the podcast like, "This is the last podcast." This is it. <laughs> I'm missing teeth. Sorry, folks. <laughs> and he's self-medicating. <laughs> oh, Lord. Uh, so that said, uh, we would like to thank you again very much for listening to this very special uh, retrospective series. And uh, take care, and always protect the crystals. Peace out. Later, Tater. All music presented on this podcast is courtesy and copyright to Square Enix.